Well, good evening, First Wednesday. It is really good to be with you this evening. Uh, we're going to be in James chapter 4. The reading is James 4, 13 to 17, just a, a few short verses. And if you want to turn that up in your Bibles, I'll be reading it in a moment. As I say, it's very good to be with you this evening. And uh, I hope this time together will be helpful for you. James Chapter 4, verse 13, James writes, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is God's word. Well, do you know your great-grandfather's first name? Do you know what he did for a living? Do you know what he was like? Do you know those kinds of things that he was into? I suspect for many of us the answer to that question is no. We don't know that information. There was a time when he had his whole life ahead of him. There was a time when the future was at his feet. And now, really, a few short years later, his great-grandchild doesn't know his name. He's been forgotten. And the truth is, the same is going to happen to us. If it happened to him, it'll happen to us. We forget it, but in the scheme of history, our time here is short. Our time is, verse 14, a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. That's just the perspective that James wants us to have about our lives. I was in Derbyshire uh, just a couple of weeks ago and a couple of times I got up in the morning, opened the curtains and there was a, a mist over the garden down towards the river at the end of the garden. And then I would go and make a cup of tea and come back and it was gone. James is saying our lives in the whole scheme of history are very much like that. It's true to say that in the last 18 months or so, we've become more aware of how fragile life is, more aware of our mortality. But in general, we don't tend to think about our lives in this way. And that is precisely why James brings it up. He's pressing on his hearers what it looks like in practice to do chapter 4, verse 10. That is to humble yourselves before the Lord. If you're familiar with the book of James, you'll know that the churches that James is writing to are in the grip of pride. They, uh, they favour the rich. They look down on the poor. They huff and puff when they've got uh, hardships to deal with because they think they're better than that. They think that they don't deserve that kind of thing. And there's all kinds of expressions of pride in the life of the church. And the heart of the letter really is chapter 4 where James calls them to repentance for this pride because actually chapter 4 verse 6 it's clear that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the reality you see if this church is in the grip of pride they need to know that in order that they don't meet God as an opponent but that they would humble themselves and receive his grace. And James has called these churches to humble themselves and he tells them what this will involve. And in our passage, this will mean remembering what your life is in order that you don't presume on God. That's the problem James sees. Have a look at verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Now we read that and we think, hmm, what's wrong with that? We like that sort of thing. One of my children goes to a school that has recently opened a new building and my wife and I went along for a tour of this new building. They were showing it off and they took groups of parents around and uh, wanted them to see this great new facility that the boys had. And our guide on the evening happened to be the head boy. And at one point in the tour, as we were moving between classrooms, one of the other parents asked him what he was going to do in the future. And he said... Uh, well, I want to study uh, these A-levels because I want to go to such and such a university and I want to get such and such a degree and then work here and do that and do the other thing. And the thing that was striking was you could see the parents looking at each other and thinking, that's impressive. This young man knows what he wants. 
And they thought that that was great. We want that kind of spirit in our boys, that type of thing. We want our children to see the future and to get on and take it. And we want that for them because that's what we are trying to do ourselves. We, we make plans and then we make plans on top of our plans at work and at home. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to move there and then I'll set this up and then I'll do that. And then I'll make some money here and I'll invest it there and then I'll retire and then I'll do all the things that I want to do. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with making plans in life. It's a wise thing to plan. The book of Proverbs in the Bible talks about planning as a really positive thing. It's true to say that fail to plan, then you plan to fail. But the problem comes when our plans are self-sufficient and self-serving. The way that we plan is about us at the centre without any regard for God. That's what's there in verse 13. Have a look. This person sees themselves as being in charge of time today or tomorrow, in charge of their place. We'll go to such and such a time. What they're going to do, we're going to trade and how that's going to go. We're going to make a profit. In other words, they see themselves as being in total control of their lives. You could say they have the Invictus spirit. That is the spirit of the William Ernest Henley poem that's so well known. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now that sort of attitude plays really well in a movie, doesn't it? But did you see how James describes it? Have a look at verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. It's pride and it's ultimately evil. Well, why is it so bad? Well, it's bad because you've presumed to leave God out of the picture. Verse 15, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. There is someone greater than all of us who is actually in charge of everything. The Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth. And this verse actually just makes clear precisely what it is that he's in charge of. So number one, he holds your life. If the Lord wills, we will live. Now, just like the mist that doesn't choose to appear and then choose to leave again, if the mist wanted to hang around in the morning when the sun rose, it couldn't. It's not able to do that. Its existence isn't in its hands. It's the same with us. Why do you think you opened your eyes this morning? Oh, you say, oh, my alarm clock went off and I, uh, I, I was stirred from my sleep. Why have you taken the breath that you've just taken now? Wherever you're watching this from, you're breathing. Why have you taken that breath? And that breath? And that breath? Oh, you say, oh, because the diaphragm is pulled flat and the muscles between the ribs pull the rib cage up and out and expand the chest. No. Well, Yes, on one level, physical causes are at work. Your diaphragm is functioning like that, but those physical causes are secondary causes. God kept you alive during the night. You were asleep. You didn't know what was going on. Who was sustaining you? God was sustaining you. And he sustains you now. And he will do so until he decides otherwise. If the Lord wills, you will live. The Bible teacher Alec Mateer says this. The Bible says that we receive another day neither by natural necessity nor by mechanical law nor by right nor by courtesy of nature but only by the covenantal mercies of God. By the covenantal mercies of God. He holds your life and he gives it to you as a gift. So an important question for us is this. Have you acknowledged that? Uh, perhaps this year has woken you up to how little control you have over your life. So do you know the God who holds that life in his hands? And have you given up control of it to him? I suppose to put it like this, will you humble yourself before the Lord? Your life's a mist. You're not the captain of your soul. You are transient 
and frail and fleeting. You know, there's something worse than dying. And that is dying thinking that you're in control. You're not. None of us are. Humble yourself before the Lord. He holds your life. Number two, he holds your future. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The this or that of your future, again, is all in the will of the Lord. Proverbs 16, verse 9, the heart of man plans his way. We make our plans, but the Lord establishes his steps. You can make your plans, but whether they succeed or fail is down to the Lord. Whether you make money or poor, or are poor, whether you're healthy or you develop a debilitating illness, whether you marry or remain single, the Lord holds all of this and everything else in his hands. So again, it's not that James doesn't think we should plan for the future. What he is against is when we are what we could describe as weekly atheists. That is, God is reserved for Sundays, but he's absent from Mondays to Saturdays. One of the ways that some Christians try to avoid this kind of presumption is by saying, Lord willing, when they talk about their plans, we want to do this, Lord willing. Or you might have seen people sign off DV at the end of a letter or an email or something, DV, Deo Volente, God willing. But James doesn't want us simply to add a couple of letters or a couple of words to the end of the way we describe our plans. He wants to go deeper. He wants for us to completely change how we think about ourselves and how we think about God. We're not the author of our own lives. We're not the captain of our souls. We're not the main character in the story even. God is the author and only he knows how the plot will unfold. And we need to press that reality down into our souls in an age that is forcing us more and more to be as self-sufficient as we possibly can be. We need to remind ourselves. We need to tell our souls that this is the case, that the Lord is in control. You know, at a mundane level, our diaries are full. We make plans on top of plans. But who is in control? Who is directing this film? At a higher level, we have our plans for life all laid out. Stay here, do this, go there, do that. But have we thought about the Lord in those plans? I think we often try to make our future happen rather than stepping into the plans that the Lord has, the role in the film that we have been cast, that we have been given. We haven't created it. It's been given to us. So the question is, what would that look like? What would it look like to to step into the plans that the Lord has for us rather than us being the author and the architect of our own plans? Well, I think it starts... It, well, it, it looks like a heart that when we open our eyes in the morning, we acknowledge that it is the Lord who has been merciful to us through another night. When we wake up and swing our legs around and our feet hit the floor, our first thought is, thank you, Lord, for breath in my body and another day. When we go and we turn the tap on and clean water comes out, we receive that as a gift from the Lord for another day. And as you look ahead, as you think about the day that is open in front of you, as you think about the week that lies ahead, as you think about your plans and your future and your finances and everything else, you commit all of that to him. You submit all of that. You give it to God as it were, but you give it back to him so that he can return it to you. You do, verse 17, have a look, the right thing. All such boasting is evil, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, the right thing to do is to submit our plans to the Lord. And just to say, at this point, some of you will have had plans that the Lord has thwarted. Maybe those plans were good plans. Things that it says in the Bible are good things and yet you haven't been given them and you haven't presumed on the Lord. You've been praying about them for years and they haven't happened. And if you're honest with yourself, your heart this evening is either broken or bitter or maybe both. 
Well, acknowledging that the Lord holds the future doesn't mean that he gives us what we want. But it's vital to remember that if you've had plans that you've submitted to the Lord and they haven't come to pass, it doesn't mean that he's left you or forgotten you. He just has different plans. See, understanding this in this way is a recognition that whatever unfolds, it is in the will of the Lord. And just because he has different plans to us doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. Because he holds the future, however hard it is to see that, keep looking to him and trusting him. Wherever this finds you tonight, if you're struggling with the plans that you had that the Lord didn't give you, keep looking to him and keep trusting him. Then there's another question that comes our way, and that is, well, as we think about this, as we think about the way we go about our lives, am I presuming on the Lord? Are my plans submitted to the Lord? How do I know that my plans are wise and godly? or whether or not they're selfish. Well, when we live knowing that we only live because the Lord wills and that every moment of our future is in his hands, it will show in our lives. You'll be able to see it. This is what the book of James is actually all about. The faith that we profess to hold is seen in the lives that we lead. And I I think you could be You could see that in all kinds of different ways, but I want to highlight two qualities that will be particularly obvious, I think, as we wind things to a close in this talk. The first quality is this, gratitude. You'll know that you are submitted to the Lord if you are a grateful person. You see, if you know that all of life is gift and that you don't deserve any of it, Your boasting will give way to gratitude. Breath in your body, clothes on your back, sun on your face. You can't fail but be grateful. And of course, for the Christian, we're grateful above all for the Lord Jesus and the salvation that he has given us through his death and resurrection. All of this is gift. And those who really know this are grateful, thankful people. When we think about life through the lens of our achievements, we think we've earned it. And we boast and then we become entitled. We think that we deserve certain things. And when we don't get those things, we get angry or sad or resentful. People who know that the Lord has willed their life are just happy to be here. And they're grateful for absolutely everything. G.K. Chesterton, writing on gratitude, said this. You say grace before meals. All right. But I say grace before the concert and the opera and grace before the play and the pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. Grateful for everything. And this kind of gratitude is usually accompanied by humility. They go together. If you're grateful to the Lord for his grace and his kindness to you, You'll humble yourself before him, which is precisely the thing that James is calling for here. The first quality of someone who is submitted to the Lord is gratitude. Secondly, contentment or or peace. When you know that your life is lived under the care and the permission of God, all the circumstances of life are under his care. You don't need to worry. However hard or uncertain things get, the Lord loves you so much that he sent his son to redeem you. And it's that Lord who holds the future and he wills it all. And so when you know that, anxiety gives way to peace. In the same way as you think about your life and your future, you don't have to be in control of everything. You don't have to strive and stress. So much of our activism and restlessness comes from a failure, I think, to commit ourselves and our struggles and our future to God and to leave it with him. In short, Or not doing that, I think, is a failure to trust that he wills every moment of life. I think it is a lack of faith. And a failure to trust that God holds your future, I think, shows up in discontentment and grumbling. One author says, our presumption blindly grabs the reins of calendars of our lives, of our tomorrows. And when we do that, it burns us out and it robs us of joy. 
But when I know that I'm just a mist, when I know that life is a gift and that the Lord and not me reigns, then peace starts to mark my life. Contentment begins to flood in. And when that happens, we're all together better people, both in ourselves and with others. Someone who is at peace, someone who is a contented soul is usually a joy to know and a joy to be around. Gratitude and contentment. Where you see those qualities, you'll see a life that is humble before the Lord. And that is the sort of life that God desires. May he help us all to live that out. Amen.